Hello, I'm Dr. Guy Yatros from Dental Sleep Solutions and DS3. Today, uh, for the Dental Sleep Medicine Insider, we're going to talk about one of the four pillars of dental sleep. We're going to talk about billing. In particular, we're going to talk about out-of-network billing uh, for both uh, uh, commercial insurance and Medicare. The Medicare version will be in uh, the next edition of Dental Sleep Medicine Insider. This one will concentrate on commercial insurance. Before we get started, one of the things we always comes up is when we first get started in dental sleep, you know, the, the insurance is a big piece of the puzzle that we're concerned with. People are, are, uh, are kind of hesitate to get started. And I'd recommend that you just get started. Pick some of your patients that uh, your friends and family just do them for cash fee while you get your insurance systems set up uh, because we want you to start getting early engaged in dental sleep because you'll realize the value of, of the efforts that you may need to put forward later to uh, actually implement this in dental sleep. So assuming we've got our insurance um, credentialing set up and we're going to start uh, working with commercial insurance and we're going to uh, file a claim, there's some things you always need and there's some things that you may need to file a claim. So I'll go through those fairly quickly and then we'll get to the verbal skills and how we actually do this in an out-of-network billing system. To file a claim, you're going to always need a copy of the sleep test uh, to show the insurance company and you may need some clinical notes, which typically we can get a lot of that information from the sleep test and even from our questionnaires that we fill out through DS3. Uh, from our patient web portal. If they're uh, severe apnea in particular, uh, we need a CPAP intolerance uh, uh, affidavit filled out on why they can't tolerate CPAP. We need a way of uh, obtaining their uh, eligibility. Uh, we can do that through an instant eligibility check in DS3 or through a phone call if you don't have DS3. You're always going to need a letter of medical necessity and prescription, ideally from the primary care, and you need to have the patient sign a proof of delivery when you deliver the device. And by the way, we don't build these out until the delivery date ever. A little different than maybe you're used to in dentistry. And you need a method to submit the claim, a 1500 form. You may need, uh, in, in almost all cases actually, you need a pre-authorization, but we have it in the May column because uh, sometimes you don't need that. If it's Medicare, you need what we call an opt-out uh, affidavit or advanced beneficiary notice. And you may need the practice parameters from American Academy of Sleep Medicine if they deny the claim for some reason. And I typically take a photo of the device uh, as well. Now, we're going to talk about out-of-network billing for commercial insurance today. And again, if you uh, want to stay tuned to the next month, we'll talk about how we do this through the Medicare model as well. Out-of-network uh, billing is a little bit uh, more difficult in some ways, mostly because we don't know the allowable amount. Uh, unless we have an agreement when we've gone in network, uh, we just can't consistently know exactly how much the, uh, the insurance company will allow. Now, the good news is uh, they oftentimes allow more than if you're in network. Um, you can have a little more flexible billing practices because you haven't signed contracts with the insurance company. And uh, worst case scenario, if, if, we're, if we're not happy with the out-of-network benefits, we can apply for what we call gap coverage, which I'll explain a little bit more uh, thoroughly in a, in a little bit. Assuming we're out-of-network, the uh, biggest concern really is that we don't know the allowable amount. So uh, again, that's where the big question mark comes in. Uh, there's three ways of, of, of billing this. One is you can do fee for service and you can just tell your patients, here's the fee, I'm going to charge my amount and uh, the checks are going to come to you and you might get some back or you may get none back. And uh, you know that works very consistently but the patients have to upfront the whole cost of care and so you're going to do a few less cases. Now another way you can do it is you can check the accept assignment of benefits box when you're filling out the 1500 form uh, and uh, that means the checks are going to come to you. and and that the patient can pay their balance. Now you can say to the patient that I expect you to pay the full amount uh, if, if the insurance doesn't pay what we hope they allow because we don't know what they'll allow once again. And that's what I call a fixed amount. The other way you can do this is more of a flexible system where you're willing to take the risk if the patient, uh, or rather the insurance company, doesn't pay as much as you allow, as you thought they were going to allow. So you can tell the patient we've estimated your benefits, here's what we think it's going to pay, and we're going to give you a worst case scenario about what, what you may have to pay out of pocket. Now understand there's a little risk if you go along with that because occasionally you're going to be wrong. So you may have to raise your fees up to accommodate that risk that you're taking. Now you can bill for every appointment uh, that you see the patients for. A lot of different codes. You can bill just the device. Today I'm going to talk about how uh, we, we do it in, in my office anyway. Uh, we, we accept the assignment of benefits and we're willing to take on some of that risk uh, in this flexible system. We really only bill one code for the dental device. We also bill a code for a uh, CBCT if we do that, but uh, that's a, a separate subject we can talk about. But as far as the dental device goes, we're only going to bill one code and that's going to include the patient's uh, appointments uh, through the six month or recall period. So here is a, uh, a flow uh, uh, sheet that I drew out that can kind of explain the process as we go through this 
with our patients. So uh, again, you can come back to refer to that. I'm going to go through each parts of this uh, for you today. Before we go through this, uh, you'll need to establish what your cash fee is. So in other words, if it was up to you and patients were just paying you cash, how much would you like to have on each patient on average to, uh, to make you happy to do this and profitable in your practice? And if you don't know how to calculate that, uh, there's a link here on the uh, Dental Sleep Medicine Insider uh, page that you can go to one of the previous um, uh, webinars that we did that'll teach you how you can calculate that cash fee based on your particular practice demographics and, and current fee schedules. Uh, so you're also going to need to know what you would consider a high deductible amount. So when a patient has such a high deductible, they're really going to get no benefit. And that may be roughly your cash fee, which uh, we'll do an example here in a minute. And you're going to have to estimate how much you think the insurance company will allow. And we don't always know that. You might set your fee a little higher than you think they'll allow. And uh, after some experience, you may get an example of, or an average of what you think most insurances allow. And again, that's where the big question mark comes in. And you need to know how much you're going to a need for the patient to get started on treatment to deposit uh, before you even take maybe impressions so that you don't get uh, caught holding the holding the bag there and not, not having uh, enough money uh, to pay your lab bill if something goes south. So we're just going to come up with an example. Don't put any credence into these numbers. These are not my exact fees. Uh, you need to come up with your own. We're not telling you what to charge here, but I just want to give you an example of how this might work. Let's say our cash fee, uh, for us to be happy to do this in our practice every day is $2,500. That's what we'd like to have on average on our patients. Uh, we consider the high deductible being about the same, $2,500. So if someone has a deductible that's over $2,500, well, we're going to really not get any coverage. And then the estimated allowable is just set it the same to make it, make it easier. You know, sometimes the, the deductible amount or the estimated allowable amount, you might raise that up a little bit from what your cash fee is. But uh, to make the math easier, it makes it uh, easier just to keep it this way. Now, the deposit is going to vary depending on the patient. Uh, in general, we want to collect at least the patient deductible whatever's remaining of the patient deductible. But it can, it can vary depending on patient and how much we think we're going to get paid and actually their ability to pay and how much we want to help that patient out. So again, uh, we've uh, changed this a little bit to include now that $2,500 in those uh, first two uh, slots there. And we'll go down each side of this. So the patient comes in and we do what we call an instant eligibility check. And now you can pick up the phone and find out this information. Through DS3, you can do this with a click of the button. And we'll find out Basically, if the patient uh, has coverage for the dental device, the E0486, if they do have coverage, how much of their deductible uh, is left to meet? Uh, and after the deductible is left to meet, what percentages the patient pays and the insurance pays? Again, we don't know the allowable amount, but if their deductible is over that amount that we just determined, so in other words, over 2,500, then we're just not going to really get any uh, uh, coverage for this patient. And so at that point, we tell the patient, look, you've got a high deductible. They're usually aware of that and say, you know, let's just do this as for a cash fee and, uh, and, and, and let's move on. And in general, if you're doing billing or you're using, if you're using a third party bill or you're doing it yourself, we just tell the patient, look, if you want to file it, you can, but the reason we're giving you this discount is because we're not even hassling with insurance. And, and so we just collect whatever deposit we feel is appropriate to get them started, uh, care credit, all those other things you can use as well, and we schedule the treatment. So basically insurance is out of the picture at this point. Okay, let's look at another example where the patient's uh, Deductible remaining for out of network is $500. And after that, we determine through our instant eligibility check again with the phone call, you can do that or a click of a button through DS3. We find out that coverage is 70 30. In other words, the patient pays 30% of what's remaining and the uh, insurance pays the remaining 70. So we just put in our numbers here. The deductible is 500. Now, our estimated allowable amount, which again, we're not sure of this, but we, we're, we're plugging in 2,500 as the estimated allowable amount in this case. We subtract out the deductible of 500, and we times 30% times the 2,000 that's remaining. So if the allowable amount's 2,500, then the patient's portion is going to be 1,100. Okay, now it could be more than that. If the allowable amount's more, uh, if, if they don't allow it for some reason, a, a lot of things can happen here. So somewhere, what we call the MOP, something we came up with is the maximum amount of pocket for the patient. If they want, really want to know what's the most this is going to cost them, then you've got to you know, give them that or, the, or they really won't want to schedule treatment. So in this case, it's going to be between our $1,100 um, and 2500 because that's our cash fee. So you know, we can tell the patient the most is going to be $2,500. So let's look at that scenario. So the patient comes in, we do that instant eligibility check. Uh, it's less than $500 uh, or $2,500 uh, deductible. Again, it was $500. We calculated the MOP. So we know that the MOP is around $1,100 is what we expect. 
But of course, we want to err on the direction of being a little bit more than that because we're not sure. We're taking some risk here. So when we talk to the patient, we tell them we expect their coverages between their 500 deductible and their 30% copay to be roughly uh, 1,100, but it could be more. The most it's going to be is 2,500, which is our cash fee. And if they say, hey, that's fine, I'm fine with that, and they want to go ahead and schedule, then we go ahead and schedule it uh, with the idea that the most they're going to have to pay out of pocket is 2,500. If they say, I can't afford the 2,500, uh, and you know they really have a high need to do this, then we can negotiate that mop maybe at 1,500, 1,700, uh, whatever we determine, uh, because again, we want to help our patients if we can. Our, our obligation is to help them, and we'll, we'll tell them that we're willing to take that risk, and whatever you feel comfortable in between there. So uh, typically, in that case, it would be maybe something like 1,500 if the patient requests that it to be lowered. At that point, we go ahead and schedule them, and we may even want to go ahead and, uh, and, and take their dep a deposit for treatment, and we can even begin the impressions, but we do not want to deliver the device until we do our pre-authorization. We need to send that through the pre-authorization, either through our own systems or through our third-party billers, and once that's in, then we can deliver the device, and then we can bill the patient. Then and only then do we bill the patient the day we deliver it. Now, when the checks come in from the insurance company, you go ahead and deposit the check. Uh, you've already collected the, uh, the, uh, at least the estimated amount from the patient. You deposit the check, and then what you do, whatever they allow, if it's less than what you build, then we write off that difference because we don't expect our patients to pay more than what their insurance company allows. So at this point, once we've deducted uh, the uh, amount from the ledger, uh, again, the difference between the allowable amount and the billable, uh, uh, you build them out, if there is a difference, uh, you write that off as, a, as an adjustment. Now the ledger is correct and we try to collect the difference. If that difference goes above what we agreed is the maximum amount of pocket for the patient, then we send them statements and uh, when the patient can't afford to pay anything above that, we go ahead and, and write off that difference per our original agreement. The last part of this scenario is a patient comes in, we do the instant eligibility check, their deductible, as we've mentioned in this scenario, is $500. Uh, we calculate that mop to be around 1100 to 2500 and the patient says, oh no, I can't afford to pay that. I can't afford to pay uh, the 2500 No, I can't even afford to pay the 1100 that you're that you're estimating on the low end. So we can do one of two things there. We can stop treatment or we can go ahead and try to find another way to make it affordable. One is, is if there are no providers in your area, we can go ahead and do a, what we call a gap coverage. And our insurance uh, third-party billers will do this for you. Uh, and again, if you're going to do it yourself, it requires getting on the phone, contacting the insurance company, and finding out, are there any other providers in network in this area? And if the patient has out-of-network benefits and there's no providers in the area, then sometimes the insurance, most times the insurance will give you gap coverage. And now maybe uh, if we go in network on this one case through the gap coverage, uh, that that mop can become a lot less and the patient out of pocket might become less. And so if that's the case and the patient agrees, we can schedule. And if not, you have to decide, does this patient really need your help? Are you willing to take less money for this case and even more risk and go below what we even estimate they're going to pay? Uh, what are you going to do if the patient has really severe apnea and they have no other choices? Are you going to want to help them or, or do we uh, stop treatment? So that's really a per case uh, uh, situation, but if you follow these flow sheets, it works out quite well. Assuming if we get that all figured out through the gap coverage or, or, or we help the patient out because of uh, their need, we're uh, going to go ahead and we've already done the pre-authorization because that happens when we do the gap coverage. We deliver the device and then the same thing applies when the, when the, uh, the payment comes in. We go ahead and deposit it and, uh, into our ledger and any discrepancies between the billable amount and allowable amount uh, we don't, uh, and at least in our office, uh, expect the patients to pay. So I hope that helps. There's the kind of flow sheet for you uh, all in one. Uh, if you just follow this uh, procedure, it, it is more complicated than being in network. It's more complicated than fee for service. But the result is we help more patients uh, with increasing their airways and their quality of life and their, you know, actually their length of life. So uh, thanks for taking the time to, to watch this on Dental Sleep Medicine Insider. Uh, tune in next month as we'll talk about uh, walking through a similar process for our Medicare patients. Thanks.